trusting Antoine in the invitation. If you can't tell it, we're brothers. <laughs> While we are very different people, he's my brother. He's had my back, and I've been blessed to have his. And it has only gotten better through the years. I'm just sorry that we don't live closer, that we can't be a little nifty every once in a while. But before I forget, uh, there is a lady in Valparaiso who was born there who moved out here for a little while, and she would absolutely shoot me if I didn't say hello from Kim Shutsky. She, uh, she loves you. She misses you greatly. But I'm kind of glad that she's back home with us. <laughs> Please open your Bibles with me to John chapter 15. John chapter 15. With Shannon, I'd like to, to say if you're visiting today thank you for being here and I'd like to ask you to open your Bibles and follow along I there's a couple of visitors who are here today who are also from Valparaiso that I just saw as I looked out so I'll be greeting Rick and Bev later but I'm just so thankful and I hope that you'll follow along and as I said earlier this week if if something I've said doesn't strike the right chord with you, doesn't seem like it's scriptural, please talk to me. As you have already seen and known, I make mistakes, and it's not just in the PowerPoint. There are mistakes that I am capable of in many ways. But what I hope is that in every way that we try to please God while we're here. He is a king that is worthy to be praised. He is a king who has given himself for us that's why he deserves the praise. He doesn't deserve the praise because of his power. Now, we would give it to him anyway, but he laid that power down. He let evil take him over and kill him so that we could be victorious as disciples and followers of his now. I'd like to talk to you now about a local church. I stole this from your website. Normally what we do as humans is we align ourselves with people that we like and that we choose. And normally what happens with humans is we look for people who are familiar. We look for people who are like us. But there's a problem in this upside down kingdom. That's not what Jesus said the kingdom was going to look like. In the kingdom, in the kingdom prophecies in the Old Testament, he says that natural born enemies would come together. Now, what a local church is supposed to look like is not a homogeneous group of people in a little club that get together every once in a while and because they all like to play cards or they all like to sing or they all like to do this or that. That's, that those are what human organizations do. A local church is different, and it can be very different. Now, I realize that's not the local church. The local church, I'm looking at it. And I'm going to throw this point out early. If we have expectations of homogeneity, I said my vocabulary wasn't very profound. I'm going to throw that one out because I had to look that one up. That means if we're all one and the same and we're exactly the same, then I think we've probably defined our faith incorrectly. Unity is different than uniformity. I'm going to say that again because unity is different than uniformity. God chose and he says in the end that all tribes all tongues all nations will join together in the praise of almighty god and what i love about this church that i can see with my eyes this morning is that you're not a homogeneous group of people god chose a people of his own possession a people of his own choosing a people when looked at through normal eyes, seemed odd. In his first choosing, it, when he chose Abram, when he chose Abraham, that was an odd choice. And the oddities didn't stay at the first choosing because he says you're going to be a stranger in a strange land. And he said, even though you don't have any kids and you're not going to have any kids for 25 more years, I'm going to make your descendants like sands by the sea and the stars of heaven. That's, that's an odd way. And we've talked about that, but... God's choices when looked at through normal eyes seem odd. Jesus' very, very first disciples, when he chose them, he says that in John chapter 15 and in verse 6. He says that you didn't choose me, 
I chose you. And I appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should abide so that whatever you ask my father in my name, he may give to you. He says, I chose you. God's choosing the family of God that we have here, that we, that we come to love, we come to appreciate, and we want to be one with when looked at from the outside in looks odd. White people and black people shouldn't go together. Indians and Hispanics, I'm sorry, first peoples, I don't, I don't know what the right, white word is, Mr. Lee. I, I, I'm just... I'm middle-aged white guy I don't know all the right words but but we ain't all supposed to be together what you're supposed to do is divide that's what humanity does humanity divides and we do that very well except the Lord's people God's choosing is different from man's choosing and the early disciples didn't get to choose either because what we see in early Christians is we have zealots and tax collectors both being chosen to be apostles. Now, can you imagine Matthew and Simon getting along when Simon's very political founding taproot was you don't go along with the Romans? And what does Jesus choose? Somebody who went along with the Romans. And then he says, you're one in John 17. Now, y'all, that's oil and water. But he says, y'all need to be one. Prostitutes and Pharisees, former, both. Y'all are supposed to be one together. Hebrew-speaking Jews and Greek-speaking Jews. You've read in your Bible in Acts chapter 6 how that there was the first problem in the church was a racial problem. Because you had Greek-speaking Jews and Hebrew-speaking Jews, and some of them had a problem. And what did the apostles do? He said, figure it out. Figure out how to be one. And then the whole Jew and Gentile thing. I don't think we appreciate how much Jews hated Greeks. But what you have to do is you have to learn history. What the Greeks tried to do, you're studying in between the Testaments. Have you gotten to Antiochus Epiphanes yet? Oh, he was. Woo. He was Hitler before Hitler was cool. Hitler wasn't ever cool. Uh, but I'm just saying, he tried to exterminate the Jews. Now think about that for a minute. Think about that thread running throughout the whole Old Testament. From Pharaoh to Athaliah to Haman to Antiochus Epiphanes. We have, what God's people have working against them and has always been working against them is a power in the spiritual places trying to thwart God's plans. And they were trying to thwart God's plans by killing the Jews. And it didn't stop until Jesus came. And so Jews, because of their history, hated white people. Because Greeks and Romans, by and large, were white people. Because what did they know about these people? They tried to oppress them. And Gentiles hated the Jews because we just here trying to do what our government tells us. Why don't, you, why don't you give us a break? And they hated each other. And then you have the educated and the uneducated. You have the slaves and you have the slave owners. Have you read Philemon? And the problem is slave owners and slaves weren't supposed to be one. The class system was they were supposed to be separate. The poor and the royalty. These are early Christians, one in the kingdom, because God chose it to be that way. But okay, I'm just I'm just gonna go there. What happens at times in America? And especially in the Southeast, where churches have divided on racial lines. And then they say, well, we like it our way and they like it their way. It's just sad. Because what they're saying is, it's okay for us to do that because we got a little doctrine that's right. Our doctrine is right, but our practice may not be, but, you know, that's how it goes. That's not what a local church is supposed to be. This morning's lesson is about a local church in an upside-down kingdom. God has a choice. This is family. We, we don't have the right to choose. 
God is choosing. And all of us have this same almost impossible command in front of us. In John chapter 15 and verse 17, he says, love one another. This isn't, this isn't an ex extra thing. He says, this is the command that I give you. Now tell me Simon and Matthew didn't have some trouble. Natural enemies. And Jesus says, I'm the king, do what I say. But in doing what I say, he showed them how to love. He showed them how to love. These things I command you. This is an impossible command. It's an impossible command in an impossible context. It had seemed to be impossible for the Jews. The Jews didn't even get along with each other. Pharisees hated the Sadducees. The Sadducees hated the Pharisees. The Essenes went off out in the desert living somewhere because they couldn't stand none of the rest of them. Now, how they, how's a Jew supposed to love a Gentile when he, can't even, when he doesn't even like his second cousin? And we ain't even talking about the Samaritans yet. We're not even talking about the Gentiles yet. To obey, to obey Jesus about loving others had to be based on something other than human power. It had to be based on something other than the right idea. It's an impossible command in an impossible context. In Matthew chapter 16 and verse 18, here is the church. It's an impossible mission. Jesus says, build my church. And my church is not going to look like an ethnic group. My church is not going to look like something else. The great examples of preaching and teaching the gospel throughout the whole God-rejecting, Christ-hating world is come. Come and let's be one. Let's join. Now, you remember all those prophecies back in the Old Testament? Where the mountain of the Lord's house will be established above the hills and all nations will flow to Jerusalem? You know how Jews read that? Everybody going to be a Jew. And then Jesus went, no, 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 no. And then Paul went, no, 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 no. That's not how it works. Yes, we are going to be one. And then Jesus said in John chapter 15 and verse 18, they hate me. Have you ever met somebody that said, well, if y'all more, act more like Jesus, everybody would love you? Y'all ever heard somebody say that? And, like, and I just want to look at them and say, have you read your Bible? Do you know what they did to Jesus? He sounds good at the outset. Love your neighbor, love, you know, he, he sounds good at the outset. But once you get to know Jesus, he is countercultural. And that's an understatement. He is challenging. Because he says, you got to love me more than you love your mama. And he said that on Mother's Day, too. Jesus would have said it on Mother's Day, too. Can Jews and Gentiles get along? The answer is not without God. Can blacks and whites in America get along? Not without God. Because we've been trying to legislate that for a long, long time. How well are we doing? How, how long has the United Nations been around trying to help all the nations of the world come under, ooh, we're all going to sing together, it's all going to be one great peaceful utopia. Hmm. Now, it's a great idea. It preaches. It sounds great. Let's all just get along. That sounds like a great idea. But how is it going to happen? The only way it's going to happen is in God. And what Jesus left his disciples to do was to set up impossible without God communities, an outpost, if you will, of a spiritual kingdom that show real love to every kind of people. Because that's what Jesus did. Whether it were Pharisees or Sadducees, zealots, prostitutes, people of ill repute, Romans, Samaritans. Here is the love of our God that he showed in his day-to-day -day life. And he said, this is what my people will do. This is how my people are going to live. No matter what has shaped your life in the past, whether it's your ethnics, 
ethnic line, whether it's your things that have been terribly done to you, whether you have done terrible things or not. All of these life-changing things, here is the mission. The only way that this works, the only way that this impossible without God community happens is by God making it possible on the earth. Jesus showed his love because he said we are valuable to him. He showed us his love because the people he chose were going to bear witness of him to what he did in the world. In John 13, we've been talking a lot about that. I'm not going to show that picture again of Jesus washing disciples' feet. But when he, when he got done, he got up and said, do you know what I've done? And I'm going to give the apostles credit. Nobody answered the rhetorical question. Because none of them knew what he had done. They did not understand. And then he said in John 13, 35, you love like I've loved you. And what had he just done? He had just humbled himself and took on himself the form of a servant and offered service to people who were beneath him in an earthly context. And then he says, do as I have done to others. By this, all will know that you are my disciples when you have this love for one another. And this, brothers and sisters, is the visible evidence of an invisible God in a God-hating world when people take up this mantle to love like Jesus. That's what Jesus said in John 13, 35. The question is, will we? In 1 John chapter 4, verse 11 and 12, John says, Beloved, if God so loved us, we ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us. And His love, did you hear this? His love is perfected, is completed in us. How is it completed in us? It's completed in us when we do what our Lord did. Now, I've been telling some folks who have been so encouraging all week, and I, I, I got to get home because uh, y'all have been too kind. I need to get home where people really know me. <laughs> they don't know me as Brother Mark. I appreciate, I appreciate all of the respect, but they just know me as Mark at home. But what this passage teaches us is that as Mark, as Tricia, as Joy, as Shannon, the visibility of God can be seen, even though he's invisible, when we love like Jesus loved. That is the salt and the light. That's our impossible job. Because you know what the world would say? It says races don't get along with each other. Different strata of education, they don't get along with each other. Because you know what happened in Russia after the Soviet Union fell? Everybody went back to their own little racial things and burgs. You know what happens in big cities? They got Polish town, they got Koreatown, they got Chinatown. Because we get comfortable in our little fiefdoms, in our, in our little enclaves. And while Jesus said, I ain't, I ain't really caring about your comfort, you need to love each other. That's what, that's, that's what Christians do. Because you see, that is an upside down community. Because what has been shown to be impossible out in the world is, here. did you hear what Jesus says? What is impossible with man is possible with God. God can make it possible for us to do this. And so we have this upside down community where people walk in and like, wait a second. I didn't know you allowed them in here. And who are them? Well, it depends on who you are. <laughs> Local churches, when we get to know and when we, we look in the New Testament, and I love the transparency of our God, None of those churches look ideal. 
he tells us it's going to be hard work. The church, as we most directly experience, is made up of ordinary people struggling at times to get along, struggling how to figure out how to be the church in a world that's changing constantly, and struggling to do its part to fulfill the Great Commission. Now, that's not what we post on our website. We're a going church for a coming Lord. Did I do it right? I mean, that, that's why, I mean, there is some PR involved on websites and stuff, but when, that, when they get to know us, you know, what, you know what they find out? There are people in here who are struggling. And then they read their Bible like, oh, they struggled with it too? Yep. You know why? Because that's part of the process. Part of the process is letting the struggle work. When looked at through normal eyes, our lives look a lot more like weakness look a lot more like problems, look a lot more like temptations and fears and sins and tears. But what we post on the internet looks more like this 35 years ago. My beautiful bride in Nashville, Tennessee, me and my white tails, white tie and tails, that ain't me. But that's the picture we took. There was a bug in Cindy's dress and it honked her off. So, oh, no, no, it wasn't a bug. Somebody stepped on her, on her train. And she only wore that thing once. And then we took it to the dry cleaner, got it preserved for all, for all of our daughters that we never had. <laughs> and they wouldn't like the cut of it anyway. Y'all are laughing because it's been happening to your family too. But this is the picture that we put up. We put up this, this picture, this wedding picture, and then this is a picture of us a few years ago at our, after our youngest son's wedding. Because these are, the, these are the pictures that you post on Instagram. The pictures where you're smiling and you look like everything's precious, everything's wonderful, and what these pictures don't show in between the almost 35 years that my bride has put up with me is a life, while it has been amazing, is a life that is also full of messy a life when we've been frazzled by circumstance. A life where we have cried. Because it's not been perfect. But this is what we want everybody to see. But that ain't real. Because there's an old adage. If you saw how sausage was made, you probably wouldn't eat it. Because if it's real from the rooter to the tutor, you know, it's, it's right, no, not, there's not a whole lot of being. Yes, he said that in church. Yes, he did. <laughs> and we all know what our lives look like. I'd like, I'd like to ask you to turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. And I'd like for you to listen how Jesus looks at the church. In Ephesians chapter 5, beginning in verse 25... Here's how the church looks to Jesus. When he says, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Now, for real, does that sound like the church to you? holy and without blemish what a local church is is messy lives and it rarely looks glorious up close but when Jesus looks at us apparently he looks at us differently those of us that are striving in faith to be disciples of our God we don't always see in real time the return on our investments in the local church we don't always see we certainly don't see ideal and we don't see it in Acts and we don't see it in Ephesians and we don't see it in Philippians and we don't see it in Revelation and we don't see it with our own eyes. And sometimes as we're walking more by sight rather than faith, sometimes, and I'm going to be real with you, sometimes church is the last place you want to go because it's not a PR event. It's not all a bunch of shiny, happy people. Sorry, R.E.M. 
And sometimes the smiles are plastic. This is the problem with having a fleshly view and getting beat down and turned around and some tempt themselves into thinking that the ideal is out there somewhere. That the ideal is out there somewhere. I just, I just have to find the ideal out there somewhere. Instead of working toward the ideal in real time, in real faith, with real disciples, struggling and striving to love God and to love each other. If we think it exists better somewhere else, as soon as we find it, we're going to mess it up. As soon as we try to join it, we're going to mess it up. If we find a church that practices what God said to do, and we live near it, we ought to join it, and we ought to wholeheartedly get to work and be a part of it. That's what it looks like. Just like a great marriage, a local church doesn't always look or feel spiritual. What makes great what makes a church great isn't Instagram worthy. What makes a church great are the extraordinarily difficult and painful things that sometimes can drive us, I said drive us crazy. I don't, I don't mean, you know what I mean. How we get frustrated and anxious and we get upset and we get impatient. These are the things that provide the very opportunities for us to strive and get more toward the ideal because we don't get any stronger, we don't get any more effective in the kingdom except through the struggle. We understand that. We understand that physically. You got to go work out in order to build your muscles. You got to run before you could run a 5K. You got to run a 5K before you can run a 10K. And all of that is struggle and it's work. And somehow we have corrupted the idea of church to be a place where we come to get entertained or a place where we come and we can sit and be fed and not be a feeder at all. Church is not for consumers. Church is for disciples. According to the New Testament, a local church's success is not measured by numbers. We talked about that earlier in the week, remember? How many times after the book of Acts do we see in Ephesians, Philippians, Galatians, how many times do we see numbers being the point? The size of its budget, the excellence of its worship, how great the song leaders are, that is a very American judgmental way of looking at church. That's what Americans do. It's not what disciples do. We're going to go through a quick list of spiritual success. You can have a copy. You can ask Keith or Hank or someone if you want a copy of this list. But I'm going to go through it quickly because I believe in practicing the golden rule. Honoring each other. Contributing to meet each other's needs. Showing hospitality to one another. And not just your friends. Don't, don't just invite the same, the same group over. Hospitality in its essence meant strangers. And in a church this side, this side don't know this side. Y'all invite each other out. <laughs> invite each other into each other's homes. Rejoice with each other's joys. Weep with each other's griefs. You see... That second one, that last one there on that list, that's where the growth really happens. When we're having a victory party and somebody's having a baby and getting married and it's all good and beautiful and wonderful, that's great. But the rubber meets the road when, you know, it's Alzheimer's or cancer or abandonment. And people are crying and they're saying, pray for me. That's where the strength really comes. That's why our Lord said, rejoice with those that rejoice and weep with those that weep. We need to pursue harmony with each other in spite of our differences. That means that Antoine and I can talk about racial issues and neither one of us get upset. We can deal with it, but we don't always deal with race issues because he's black and I'm white. Because there's something more important in our lives than black and white, and that's Jesus. And when churches do that sort of thing, that looks odd out there. But you know what? That's going to touch hearts. When we pursue things other than our differences. When we don't exclude those beneath us 
economically, educationally. There are folks who feel left out. What did Jesus do with those people? He invited them up, didn't he? He invited them to be a part. He didn't chastise somebody. I mean, he, he sat and talked to the Samaritan woman. And his disciples came back in John chapter 4 and looked at him like, what? Because that's not how things were done. He wasn't, he wasn't going to and doesn't exclude the lowliest of people in the gospel. And the idea as a disciple is, if you're good enough for Jesus, you're good enough for me. But we also know that's not how everybody works. But in an upside-down kingdom, that's how it works. We submit to one another. You ever know somebody to extort their way in a church? Well, if you don't do this, I'm leaving. And you know what? If somebody will say that, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. <laughs> After trying to have a conversation with them. Because people... We, we need to yield to each other and be a part of each other and submit and be humble with each other because we're striving for unity even amongst thorny issues because the New Testament is filled with thorny issues that would have divided. We got the Jewish Church of Christ, the Gentile Church of Christ, and the Samaritan Church of Christ, and, they, and that's not how it was supposed to work. We're supposed to get along and deal with issues. And we have to use the principles in the Scriptures in order to deal with these sorts of things. We use our individual freedom as a stepping stone for service, not for selfishness. Because in America, freedom means I get what I want when I want it. Well, we ain't Americans first. Galatians 5.13 says, You are free. Use your liberty to serve one another. And we need to be serving each other. And we need to be bearing with each other's weaknesses and foibles and immaturity. Don't start making lists. When I was a kid, I sat in church and I wondered, I wonder who's the big toe. I wonder who's the pancreas. I wonder who's the appendix we can get rid of and not, not really hurt. <laughs> yes, that was my mindset as a teenager. Hopefully we have matured past that bearing in patience with each other covering each other's sins with forgiveness being willing to forgive see the Bible class lesson on what we're going to do in order to be reconciled with our brothers and sisters stirring up each other stirring up each other in love and godliness and coming together as often as we can, meeting regularly and all the time as much as we can in praise to God and strengthening one another. And then when we've exhausted ourselves, we are unprofitable servants. We've only done what our Lord has commanded us to do. We don't, we don't, we don't look for somebody to pat ourselves on the back. In Luke 17, 10, he told the story. He says, now what master... Tells his servant after he's done everything that he was supposed to do, now fix my meal. Or does he say, no, 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 you go ahead. It's been a time. No. And he says, and then when you have done all that you could do, say we are unprofitable servants. Because you know, you know what we do when we exhaust ourselves? We want somebody to know. We want somebody to tell us that we're good. And you know for a disciple who's good enough? Jesus that's supposed to be good enough now praise be to God we have a community that will take us up that will lift us up that will help us and be with us because sometimes there are some servants who will exhaust themselves and get tired and fall prey to the tempter this list of what local success looks like is not even the whole list. But local churches are designed 
by Jesus to be communities where this impossible without God love only works when folks trust in God, they trust and believe in the resurrection, and they, they believe that heaven is real. This is the foundation of how all of this has to work. The singing in the Bible classes can be great, but that doesn't mean the church is great. The preaching can be great, but that doesn't mean the church is great. The deacons can do all the things right, and that doesn't mean the church is great. The elders can never make a mistake in judgment, but that doesn't mean that there aren't mistakes made because we, aren't work, we don't work with ideal, perfect people. Now, we want the ideal and the perfect so we don't get frustrated. We want everything to go our way so that we can have some comfort. And I think the Achilles heel over the last couple of years was we all got uncomfortable and we showed ourselves in our discomfort, in our whining, in our complaining, in our finger pointing, rather than in our humility coming together as one and finding a way through a difficult time. And I don't know how y'all did or not. I'm talking about a broad scope. I have some warnings for our pilgrimage that I'd like to talk with you about. Without this impossible, without God love, communities like this church can degrade into consumer-based operations. And what I mean by that is, y'all just come and the team will put on a show for you. Or it can go into empty formalism where you wear the right clothes and you do the right things and you shake each other's hand and you go on about your business and nothing has really changed. Nothing's really challenged. You have this touched my heart kind of formless spirituality where you do good and you have civic pride and you're doing good. Now, please, don't, there's nothing wrong with doing good. But doing good is not the end. And what that ends up being is the dead remains of a club that when the preacher makes a mistake or the production isn't as good or the potlucks ain't what they used to be that consumers find someplace else to consume. What this church needs to stand for and what I pray it does stand for is the Lord's way. Even when everybody else says it looks upside down. Because Jesus did not design the church to be a place where dreams come true. Actually, it's where a lot of ideals get crushed. Because a lot of times we come into church and we think we know we know what church is supposed to be like. And we think we know and we get and we get to know that we get to know other people and we're disappointed when people make mistakes. Imagine if you'd been there in Antioch when Paul withstood Peter to the face. What other church are you gonna go to? Where somebody ain't a hypocrite. What are you gonna do when you find out Paul's background? When you hire Dick Tracy to come in and we got to find something out about this man. He can't be all that he says he's going to be. What are you going to do when you find out that Matthew, he used to be a Roman tax collector? Do you see that? Do you see that's how people, sometimes when you come in and there's transparency, sometimes transparency quash ideals. It's like young people growing up hearing the great words of Jesus and the apostles and they grow up and they realize that a lot of the adults around them have clay feet and have made mistakes and keep on making mistakes. And you wonder, what are these young people going to think? Well, what they got to think is, yeah, they make mistakes, but these are the people that love me. These are the people who have been teaching me. Be real with folks. And say, sometimes problems happen. Our personal expectations can easily become tyrants. 
That's the American way. If you don't do what I like, I'm going to find some place that does because we're consumers. Jesus didn't design the church to be a place where dreams come true. Jesus designed the church to be a place where love comes true. Where are you going to find this kind of love out there? But you know, people are looking for it everywhere. They're looking for it at ball games. They're looking for it at nightclubs. They're looking for it in Etsy. I mean, they're, they look, they're, looking for, they're looking for love everywhere they can find it. And they ain't finding it in any place like that. Even when it's dolled up on TV and media, even when... Real love is what disciples are looking for. That's why when it comes time for church, the picture of community, we should have our minds not on some utopian harmony. But it needs to be that upper room where Jesus watched his disciples' feet. It needs to be Gethsemane where he prayed and was told no. Brothers and sisters, the, the effectual fervent prayer of righteous people works. But you know what else is true? Sometimes God says no, and his disciples have to be okay with that. Because the, what led us to Calvary, what led us to Golgotha, is God telling his son no. No, there's something bigger and better that I have than taking this cup away from you. And brothers and sisters, if he can tell Jesus no, he might tell us no. But we still, like Jesus, submit to the will of our Father. Because that's what real love is about. I beg your forgiveness for what I'm about to say. Forty years ago, Stephen still sang a song, If you can't be with the, love you love, if the, one, with the one you love, love the one you're with. And that is a terrible <laughs> in, in the context. But I want to take it from a terrible context to a perfect context. You don't belong to a perfect church. He's not a perfect preacher or pastor, and neither are the rest of you. But what God has called us to do is to love the one you're with. Love the people who you are around. Love the people who are part of your community and turn it upside down. Because in the world, it says you can't trust anybody else. Everybody's going to fail you. And people, people get in their own little holes and they get all edgy and frustrated and they scowl. And then maybe you invite them in here. And you saw what I saw on Wednesday night. And it wasn't PR. I know it's not perfect. But be real. And love the one you're with. Local churches like this one are not ideal. Disillusionment happens. Restlessness happens. Boredom happens. Discontentment happens. But when those things are happening to your brothers and sisters, wrap them up. When folks are disappointed and when there are problems, point them to the Scriptures and show them these same things that are happening among us have happened to, dis have happened to disciples all the time. And it's our tempter who's trying to tempt us away from the way of God. We don't get to choose the disciples that we live with. God has chosen them. You see, there's been a point the last couple of lessons. God has the choosing. And what we do as his disciples, it says, yes, Lord. There are disciples and there are stories in areas like northwest Indiana and Nashville and Birmingham and Tampa where they get to hop around all different places. And that's a terrible, that's a terrible reputation in those places where I'm going to find me a church that I like. How about we find a church we can love? And you know, what, you know what's going to happen on the way of loving other people? You're going to end up liking them. Even though they're very different from you. Ask Antoine to show you that nifty picture sometime. We were very different men. But do you know what brought us together? One Lord who loved us despite our problems. What we get in the local church is an incredible privilege and opportunity. This abundant life that he promised us in John chapter 10, it's life as a disciple. 
It doesn't mean, it doesn't mean you're going to profit. In fact, you may get used up. Like Paul said, I'm being poured out as a drink offering. Paul was used up at the end. But you know what? Being used up is a good thing. Because that means you've lived. You've lived as a disciple. You've loved. You've hurt. You've cried. You've been loved. You've been rescued. You've been prayed over. You've prayed over other people. You've been discipled by God. And the invisible God is seen in those moments. When a local community of serious disciples show the love of Christ to their brothers and sisters, to their neighbors, to their enemies, to the people that they work with. And they tell them about this amazing grace because while we're here, we're going home. When we won't be tired anymore, when we won't be frustrated anymore. Because we spend our time loving by this all will know that you are my disciples when you love other people like I have loved you that's an upside down community but it's based on the whole upside down nature of the sacrifice of the king this morning I'm sitting over here and he's leading I'm the one and you don't know me very well but there are some songs that just gut me and that one did. And it still does. And I hope it always does. I hope I never get to the point where songs like that don't have an impact. If you've been the one and you've never come to Jesus, if you've never come to him like the Bible says, in hearing the gospel to believe and repent, to confess his name, to confess your belief, to confess your loyalty to the king, if you've not been immersed in water for the forgiveness of your sins, Knowing the Savior, hear the call of the gospel, come and be a part of this kingdom. It's going to challenge you. But it's the greatest thing. It's the greatest, it's the greatest thing you could ever do with your life is to give yourself to Jesus. If we can help you in that.